Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, welcome. This is our final session, session three of our workshop series, Personal Finance for Entrepreneurs. I'm Nate Conroy. I'm with the nonprofit Rain. We are funded by a bunch of local partners and, and actually, you know, uh, local and state partners. They're listed at the bottom here. We're really thankful for them and their funding to make this program possible. One cool thing about being a venture catalyst uh, with Rain is that my job is to listen to entrepreneurs and then try to connect them with experts and education that can help them further their business. And one thing I, I kept hearing from local entrepreneurs is that, you know, they wanted to talk about their personal financial situation and how that affects their decision to go into entrepreneurship and also their, you know, thoughts about staying in entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, it's funny because that's a, it's a, it's such a clear thing. I mean, we obviously all come to entrepreneurship with a personal, with our beliefs, which are with our situation, you know, related to personal finances. And, uh, but it's a topic that's often not really discussed. Um, and so we've been really grateful, uh, to Brett Heaton Juarez for his presentations in the past two sessions. And we're excited for today, uh, wrapping it up, by the way, if you're listening to this, uh, via recording, um, we're going to make available as well the um, worksheets and you know these recordings uh, available to everybody as well. So go ahead and find those on our website. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Brett. Thanks so much. All right. Nate, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for being here. Happy Friday to many of you. When I used to work Tuesday through Saturdays, I always would hate it when people would tell me that. But, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll split the difference. Um, as Nate said, I'm a practicing certified financial planner. And this is the third of a four-part series. We talked about mindset in week one. We talked about the menu, all of the options that are on the table that you might come across in week two. Today, we're going to talk more about specific financial recommendations that apply to most people, not all, most, in various stages of the entrepreneurial journey. And then the fourth part is going to be one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations uh, that Rain has sponsored as a resource. And I think it's really key what Nate just said is that this talk in my preparation for it is keeping in mind that this is going to be recorded. So I'm really going for breadth so that you can be like, what is it? He, I said that thing about that thing and go back and listen because that's more important than depth, especially when you're trying to figure this thing out and you know, who knows where you'll be in a year or two or three or 10, right? So I'm glad you all have found it helpful so far. Just a call back to homework from last week. We talked about identifying people that could be on your informal board. People like to be asked for their wisdom, and that is highly preferable than struggling and worrying alone at night on your phone in bed. Ask people, get help. So we uh, sent some cash flow things. Um, I said a my philosophy around financial planning. Hopefully those things were helpful. Just as a primer for today, financial planning is a system. There are three broad spheres or circles of that system. They have different attributes. They work together to get you where you need to go over time. Today, we're gonna to add two new elements, kind of bookends, because we have, on the one hand, mindset, how you personally interact with cash and credit, investing, insurance and risk. And then on the opposite end, we have taxes. Taxes are an external system, they are what they are. There's a lot of lobbying involved, but those are going to have very practical consequences for you as a business owner. Um, this presentation, here's the disclaimer, it's not meant 
as binding personal tax legal advice for any person that is listening to this. It is meant to be a broad overview to inform you and be a better educated consumer and client. Um, I think a key issue as people engage with financial professionals of all kinds is that either the client brings a problem, which is a symptom of all sorts of other things, or the professional maybe has one or two things in their wheelhouse and they kind of take the client's problem and put it over here. Like, okay, so you're looking for help on cash flow and accounting. Well, I do investments and it can kind of be co-opted in that way. So the plan for today is to get you to a kind of a 90% confidence level. Okay, maybe it's 80%, maybe it's 91%. The key point is that something is better than nothing. Sooner is better than later. Time is money. I think every current or aspiring entrepreneur appreciates that. And so from my vantage point, doing something is going to help long-term. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to wave a magic wand and be, quote, ready. The goal is to start somewhere. So our phases from W2 to 1099 and a little bit of overlap in between, we're going to have three phases. We'll talk about taxes, mindset, insurance, investments, and cash and credit at each phase. Along the way, um, I have some things that I use with clients and a few stories that I'll share um, to kind of interrupt this or and I give you some visuals. Okay, first, mindset. We're not going to go back and redo week one. One of the things I think really helps is to kind of report to work. Like, when do you work? You can't be half working all the time. Um, that will really give you, along with talking to other people, feedback as to whether or not this feels real. Like, oh, I like doing this. I'm excited to go to work on my idea. To that end, read your focus plan. We gave you a template in week one. Okay, cash and credit. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is hard for entrepreneurs. In phase one, when you are considering taking the leap, maybe leaving your job, you know, you're about to introduce a whole lot more volatility and risk into your household income. You just want to be aware of where things are at at the start. So can you all see this screen? Yeah, we see it. Okay. So this is a budget for a household making about a hundred thousand. And this is what they sent back, okay? We've got some rent, some bills, some groceries, some estimates. There isn't any purpose or there isn't anything entered in savings and investing because they didn't really know. And so we ended up with a total surplus in this case of $572. Now, what I've observed practically speaking is that most people, if they kind of are new to this process, Whatever they think is left over, it's usually about half, give or take. Now, what you want to do is make sure that your total surplus or deficit equals zero because anything that is left over, even if it's an emergency fund, it should be in here because that gives every single thing intention. It's hard to get advice when you're like, how much are you able to save? Like, well, I don't know, it varies. Like, okay, well, we gotta, we gotta try somehow to put a number on it. And so additions to this budget were like a vacation escrow account, Christmas gifts, escrow. They came back with, oh yeah, we stream stuff. Okay, that's in there. 
So now we're getting, we're becoming more aware of what is. So that's the first phase in your personal finance journey, no matter where you're at with, with your entrepreneurship. Now, to continue on this, what we're sort of looking for is we want to divide this into three categories. What are your fixed expenses? What do you absolutely have to cover every month? This particular person, they were younger. Okay. We just kind of aggregated their fixed bills. Then what are your goals? That could be an emergency fund. It could be loan reduction. And then what is flexible? It looks simple on screen. The breakdown in financial planning conversations is a lot of people have no idea what these three numbers are, but that's going to be the starting point. Because, and I'll send this out after, most people hate budgeting because things don't happen every month. They happen once or twice a year. You fix your car, you know, you go on vacation. And so if you think like a business, you have capital expenses, you plan ahead. So, all right, we're going to spend this much on equipment. How do we average that out across the months? And so this is a, just kind of an exercise that I work through. Basically takes the idea of property taxes, where if you have a mortgage, the lender says, hey, you're going to pay for property taxes in an escrow account every month because we don't want to ask you for the money once a year. So you're probably not going to have it. A lot of people won't. And that'll be a mess. So deferred spending here. Okay. Slide that back over. Now, other things to do before you take the plunge in phase one, secure access to credit. Um, credit has definitely a bias towards W-2 income, even though people are downsized all the time. Um, W-2 income is considered very reliable. Variable income is not, even if the, the variable average is good. So the problem when you're a new entrepreneur is it doesn't matter if you made, you know, 7,000 a month for two months. Two months is not enough time for a lender to be like, oh, yeah, you're on your way. It's going great. They often need two years average tax returns in order to issue credit. Now, um, one workaround, you could rely heavily on a cosigner. But if your spouse makes 100000 and you don't make any, that's the number that they're going to underwrite on. Um, what I, you know, like when I wrote my book and my revenue went down, I basically put it on a home equity line of credit because I didn't have a better option. Right. So having access to credit is important because the hard stop is not being able to pay a bill. So that's not encouraging taking on debt. And the reason I stress lines of credit is that you're not borrowing and paying interest, whether you need it or not. You're only borrowing what you need or you're only paying interest on what you need when you take it. All right. Um, the next two, investing and insurance. So if we think of investing as energy. We talked about water. Okay. Starts as a little trickle mountain stream, gains energy over time. What I often hear as a barrier to entry in self-employment is I won't have a retirement account. And the answer is usually, well, yeah, A, you'll still have one. You just won't be adding to it through your paycheck, but you still have one. And B, if it makes sense to get a new one, you can do that. There, lots of people are self-employed. So if you imagine that river, that mountain Colorado River, 
Columbia River. Well, that's a little I'm trying to think of a good Pacific Northwest River. Uh, Columbia is a good know. one. You got it. Okay. Yep. So, you know, just because it doesn't rain and you're not adding more money, the river, the current is still flowing. Right. So basically, if you stop adding to retirement, that doesn't necessarily mean that your retirement is off track. It just means you've paused. There's a dry spell. Okay. Here's an example. So this person has 50,000 in a retirement account and they've stopped contributing because they're doing their thing. 360 months is 30 years earning average 7%. That amounts to $405,000 30 years in the future in this example. So basically that retirement account that's working because you've invested your money. Other people are trying to make it grow. Other business owners are trying to grow the pot as much as they can. Now, conversely, if you overshoot it and you take the money back out, that 50,000, if you take it out because you need it, which you might, you're going to pay 10% penalty and then often 20% tax we just used. So you're left with significantly less. And if you let that grow, you're at 186. So that's sort of the cost not of stopping W-2 employment, but of taking retirement money out early. So, oops, let me go back. So the key thing for this pre-phase is just dial your retirement down. Maybe do only the match, maybe don't do anything for a while. You also can make your investments much more cautious. And um, a key point here is the Roth IRA, well, is really fantastic because any contributions that you make to a Roth IRA, you can pull those contributions out without a penalty, without taxes. So it's a great kind of plan A, plan B thing where you're like, well, the, I've, hopefully it's a retirement account, but if I need it, I can get it. Whereas with a 401k or traditional IRA, you're almost always going to pay that penalty and taxes. All right, next up, risk and insurance. Um, Long-term disability insurance is often overlooked. Um, and there are some different reasons for that. But the reason why it's on here early is because like this is an example of a long-term disability policy for uh, a 35 year old it's an example job a is what she is currently making as a salaried employee the blue is the long-term disability coverage that she has through this job. Most larger employers have this coverage. It's pretty standard, not always, but it's there. There's a gap of $2,800. Meaning that if she were out of work, the household take-home pay would be $2,800 less. That number times 10, is 28,000, you know, like, so that really adds up. Basically, your health is your wealth. And of all the things that can truly just blow up your, your business ideas, you not being able to work is a big one. The reason why it's here before you take the plunge is that companies that 
offer disability insurance are insuring your paycheck. If you don't have two years of income from self-employment, they're not, they're not going to write you, they're not going to give you a policy. Okay. So what would happen is if she said, all right, I'm done, I'm going to be self-employed, her current group coverage, the blue, would disappear because that's connected to her as the employee, but she would have a private policy which covers about 1900 bucks a month. That can keep the lights on metaphorically or literally if she's not working for six months or a year or whatever. All right, let's move this back. The other thing um, on here, term life insurance. Um, it's important because oftentimes people check that box mentally if they have it as a benefit through work. Well, if you're going to be self-employed, that's not automatic. So, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, most people should have some amount of private term life insurance. And lastly, review your employer benefits before you leave, because after you leave, it is what it is. <laughs> so it's a good idea to be like, all right, I have an FSA and all these other things in there. All right. And last thing for phase one, taxes will just totally be on your radar in a whole new way as a business owner. Um, like I talked to someone two days ago, she has a kayak um, rental company in the Milwaukee River. So she's self-employed. She is in this kind of bottleneck scenario where she she wants to earn more money, but she needs to have a certain amount of deductions because she doesn't want to earn any more because then she'll lose her um, health insurance marketplace current you know, rating, like she'll lose her subsidy. So it's like, oh, I make a thousand dollars more, but my insurance is going to triple. Like, ugh. So those are the kind of things that come up. Um, all sorts of business related expenses. I think the key is like, if you can use it for your business, it's probably deductible. That doesn't mean you can't also use it for your, uh, yourself, your home, your family. Right. So think of a business expense as you're getting a deduction of your tax bracket every time. So if someone is in the 22% tax bracket, which is Google federal tax brackets, um, and they buy something for $10, it sort of costs them $7.80. You got to be careful kind of jumping ahead, but it's easy to rationalize all sorts of things with that logic, but it is a discount if you can run it through your business. Um, now, another reason to start just tracking things, even before you have an LLC or anything on paper, is because you can carry those expenses from the past into a current tax year um, because like losses can can look back. So again, I'm not an accountant. Um, this is a little piece of yours truly tax return. Schedule C, okay? And what you're looking at is hard to interpret if you're actually using software. It's much easier. It'll ask you questions in English instead of these categories. Um, but the reason I want to show, show it on screen is that in year one, my taxable income from book sales was $352. But I could go back to the last three or four years. I got my editor. I've got um, the square footage of our house plus the office space, and I'm bringing those losses against current income. So this is an amount of money 
that we could deduct against income in other places like my other business, my wife's income. So the key point is like get organized. Like if you're serious about doing it, just start keeping track of stuff now. You don't have to take action, but don't lose track of what you've spent. Because oftentimes our business is our passion and we would do things because we want to. And it's like, you know, expense that yarn or varnish or what, you know, whatever it is. And Brett too, could you pause and just say, cause I know a lot of entrepreneurs, right? They, I guess it's, that's interesting what you put up there. Cause, cause you included your home stuff and, and mm -hmm. it is true that a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they're probably, they they oftentimes spend some amount of time, you know, doing their business from home to start with, you know, maybe mm -hmm. before they go get space or whatever. So I just thought that was interesting too, that you were sort of keeping track of those items that, you know, probably if you're working from home, they do, they do serve somewhat of a dual purpose or, mm -hmm. um, and again, you're not a tax person, but I like your idea of keeping track of things. Maybe especially, I know, you know, especially if you're, if you are using something exclusively, or your business, like a certain part of your house or a certain desk or whatever, that's the kind of stuff to mm -hmm. especially be keeping track of. Cause that's, you know, much more likely to be able to be deducted. Yeah. And, and so either an accountant or software like TurboTax will walk you through that. Cause they're not going to be like, so like with the home office example, it's like, what's the square footage of your house? What's the square footage of your office space? Now, if you say that your whole house is your office, you're going to be asking for trouble. <laughs> so it's like, you do have to be realistic, but I think the mental shift for the entrepreneur is there are a lot of tax incentives to start new businesses. A, because it's hard and because we want to promote innovation. Um, so yeah, get organized. Okay. Next phase. Now we're adding some self-employment. It's happening. We're live. Okay. We're doing stuff. We went to the farmer's market. We made $17. It's happening. Um, this is where I really go, like keep going back to rain because it's, it's like, it's all about access and networking and ideas. And like those, this is not, you don't have to be on your own. A lot of times people don't do that because they're embarrassed. I wish I was further along or that's not helpful. It's easier said than done, but not helpful. Uh, set short. And Brett, you can't, you can't mention me without, or mention rain without me jumping in. Yeah. Just to say folks, like, I think the, some of the best interactions I've had with entrepreneurs have been sort of those 25 minute check-ins or whatever, where it just helps to sort of like you know, be like, here, here's what I'm thinking, or here's a decision I have coming up. What are your thoughts or whatever? Sometimes it's just good to talk to somebody about that stuff. And we're not, we're not going to invest in your business in a sense. So you don't have to like, you don't have to impress us, you know, or whatever, or, yeah. and, and we're also not going to charge you every time you reach back out. So um, I, I do think it's helpful, uh, helpful to kind of uh, have rain serve that purpose. So, all right, that's it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Separate bank accounts. You gotta have a business checking and savings and ideally a credit card. Because once you start commingling things, you'll get very confused and boundaries will be blurred and you just wanna know what's what. So you're not committing to anything. In fact, it doesn't even have to be labeled. It doesn't have to be a business checking account. It just needs to be a checking account that you only use for business. Doesn't accounting wise, it doesn't matter. Um, the second thing is because entrepreneurship can be more volatile than employment. Think of it earlier. We did the kind of what's the best that can happen. What's the worst that can happen exercise. Think of your, kind of levels of your emergency fund. So maybe it's like, all right, if I don't make it, if I'm in the hole after three months, like what will I do? Okay, I would pull it from here. Okay, then where would I access money? Uh, maybe that's, I, I take 5,000 out of the home equity line of credit. But then what would I do? 
don't know, maybe I pull a few thousand out of my Roth IRA because there's no penalties. So I agree with Nate's point, like, especially with business owners, the like, the Friday call of like, hey, I was thinking about a couple of things. I wanted to know what you thought about them. Like, that is extremely helpful. Uh, so, because it can be messy. Now, this is the point where you really get into the, that cash flow sheet that I sent. And there's a couple of things that, now this is, um, all these things entered in here are um, actual numbers of an actual business. I tweak some, but you know, this is, this is a real example. You can work in some forecasting and some boundaries. So I'm on the business tab and let's say you have 10,000 in your business at the start. Well, if all these assumptions hold true, you'll have an idea of what your bank balance in your business will be in the future. Now, if you change this number to zero, all these numbers will change, including in February, we've got a deficit or negative 2714. So that means we either need to make some more money or reduce expenses or have access to credit for that. Because the challenge being self-employed is, especially with me, I'm a hopeless optimist, so I can just rationalize anything. They're like, yeah, I'll work, I'll work it out. I'll work it out. And uh, it doesn't always work out as well as I might think. It also can be helpful when you're getting into things like, should I hire someone? If this 70 or, or fire someone to that, you know, if you change this to 5,000 and I'm going to have to copy and drag it over and do that. This went up quite a bit because every month there's a compounding effect. Now, the personal side is integrated. Okay. Um, I know in this example, it's the person's uh, water bill. Is there's this kind of um, cash out expense? Like, if I were doing mine, I would say that you know my parents mail me a check for a hundred dollars every Christmas, so I can count on that. Been doing that for twenty years, no inflation adjustment, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Um, and you can also think of like, all right, do I pull money from a loan? So this is very adaptable. I mean, clearly we look at this a lot of different ways. Um, a sheet like this, shout out to Clara CFO, who, wherever you are. I really wish I found this earlier because I knew this conceptually, but I didn't have a way to model things. That also is going to be very helpful if it's not just you financially, but you're working with a partner, a business partner, a personal partner. I think it can be exciting too. I love to, I mean, just, you know, even just being able to imagine what that, what it could be, you know, if you yeah. put in the number, it's great too. Yeah, it can be encouraging in, in, yeah. in, in the sense of entrepreneurs are often thinking, you know, should I, should I continue or not? You know? And so I think it'd be helpful in that way too. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that spin on it. That's also true, Nate. Okay. So when you're starting your self-employment journey, really think of investing as invest in yourself, invest in the business. Because investing has got to be like five years out or more to get really predictable results. You can get lucky short term, but it's longer term to get predictable results. You remember back to last week. So I can't really think of a time where someone was really scraping, starting up, getting going, where it made more sense to invest long term than it did to reinvest into their business. Now, uh, there are plenty of ways to do that. And maybe this is where your partner has some savings, you know. But I think the key thing to remember is that 
when your business is successful, it is likely that you'd be able to sell it. Not always, but most ventures, you'll be able to sell it. And if you do, you'd get some money for that. And that's part of your retirement too. Because for you as the owner of the enterprise, there's two components. There's your owner draw, how much you are taking out of your business, paying yourself to work in it. But there's also the value, the valuation and your percentage ownership of that. Okay, now that we've got a live thing out in the marketplace, we need liability. L is for liability. Uh, you don't want to get sued without an LLC because then all of your personal assets are available for um, <laughs> to pay a lawsuit. So um, the U.S. is very unique in the world in terms of being super litigious. Um, I remember being young, hearing about the McDonald's hot coffee in the lap lawsuit. Uh, and, and so that's the world that we live in. So if your business is an LLC and uh, you're making, you have a food truck and, you know, someone gets food poisoning and, you know, causes an accident and whatever the case may be, and you're sued. Well, all they can really take is the truck and maybe the thousand dollars in the bank. They can't go after your house or your own retirement savings. That's all separate. It's a separate entity. Um, the other thing is really getting a quality property casualty um, insurance person. If you have inventory, if you have physical assets, if you're a consultant, doesn't matter as much, but that's something to think of. Like now you got all this stuff because insurance is about transferring risk. So will your, another example I had recently was like, this guy's a self-employed collector. He like has like tons of Legos and antiques and he's like a dealer. And he's keeping it in his basement. So if his house goes on fire, it's not just the house, it's it's $500,000 worth of stuff. So that's the sort of thing that you have to consider. Okay, last for phase two. So now we have some actual numbers to work with. Tax and accounting. Now, I think accounting, and granted, I am not an accountant. I cannot give anyone tax advice. I know more about taxes and accounting than probably 90 something percent of the <laughs> of the people out there. Um, but it, it's it's interesting because most accountants, at least entry level accountants, are not a strategic partner. They're going to make the best of what already happened. Meaning they're not really driving strategy. They're saying, all right, well, where'd you end up? Did, did you do this? Did you do that? Oh, maybe you should do that, you know? So one mistake I've seen for new entrepreneurs is that they hire an accountant and they think that it's kind of taken care of when really their business is so small that it it's kind of an afterthought for the accountant and there's just not a lot of, I don't know, oversight. And accountants are expensive um, and they should be. My point is just that like, there are a lot of tools, self like TurboTax, self-employment, where if you're involved, you can get a lot of it yourself. Um, Another thing since, you know, big purchases come up is think about a company vehicle. If you're, if you're due, forget about your, your, your business. If you are on the verge of a car, um, should the company own it? Should you deduct mileage or should you, should the company buy the vehicle and get that as a tax deduction and then the depreciation? So that's a big ticket item where people don't always think of that, but kind of going back to why credit is so important early on 
is the goal of entrepreneurship is to make it look like you earn as little as possible to save taxes. And then the irony of that is like when you go apply for credit, it's like, you don't, you only earn 20,000 a year. And it's like, well, yeah, but it's really more like 70, but I deduct all these, you know, and then it's kind of like a catch 22. Um, and then also just local resources, uh, subsidies, tax credits, there's always stuff there too. Um, an example recently was daycare owner with the vehicle thing. It's like, we need a new, we need a new van. We want something that can tow. They have three growing kids. So basically they just got a family vehicle, but the daycare center owns it and helped with their taxes and it's legal. All right. Phase three. Now. I'm defining phase three as like the business is looks pretty solid. Like we're established. Okay. We're out of survival mode. Um, we're not a fortune 500 company, but you know, things are looking positive. The mindset is all about ROI and your time. Um, because your gift and your <laughs> child is your business. So the best ROI is going to be to focus on your business. That said, handing things off to a certified, to a financial advisor, insurance agent, uh, accountant, without asking any questions, well, that's not good either. Um, so that DIY versus delegate is kind of a continual thing. The other thing is... Um, Profit, so from a personal finance perspective, profit is more important than revenue. If a business makes 10,000 in sales a year and the owner keeps 5,000, that's 50% going to the owner. Is that better or worse than a $100,000 business where the expenses are 80,000 and the owner manages to take 18. It's hard to say because while 18 is more than five, 80,000 of expenses, you need to like, you're really like reliant on keeping these, this totally the treadmill. So I don't know if I explained that quite Nate, Do you know what, do you know what I mean there? I feel like I, I kind of, my 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 point is that like in terms of assessing business health, we're looking for profit, not sales, because you can have sales and be one bad month away from imploding or going mm -hmm. out of business. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's my point. Mm -hmm. So at this level, uh, you can start thinking about using um, assets like uh, permanent life insurance or liquid investments as collateral. Because when you have collateral, that always lowers the interest rate. And if you have those things, oftentimes um, you can, yeah, you can include those. Um, I have some business owner clients who have life insurance policies um, where if they pass, the first beneficiary is the bank because they have loans. Second up is their family. Now, in their case, it makes sense, but like when you have different assets, you have options. Um, we talked about the taxation of, of CDs and short-term money markets last time. It kind of represents a drag. Um, and I think the point with the ROI, just in the, in the, the, the broader, you know, news media and so on is like, and we hear a story about a billionaire. What oftentimes is overlooked or maybe misunderstood is that sometimes people think that they have a billion dollars in the bank and their net worth is a billion. And most of the time, it's mostly the valuation of their companies. So to kind of 
bring that back down into closely held businesses, that is a shift. And that if you're Googling, like, how much do I need to retire? Like a lot, like your venture is your, your wealth building engine at this point. Um, okay investing these are different options you can google these things they have different pros and cons um, good retirement accounts for businesses the rhythm changes um, when you have a consistent paycheck you often contribute to a 401k every month as a deduction if you're self-employed at any stage it's far more likely that you will wait and see how it goes at the end of the year, how much you owe in taxes, and then respond accordingly. So come February, March, I'm checking in with people. It's like, all right, well, it looks like I'm gonna owe, you know, 5,000. So let's, let's see if we can get that down. Let's add to our SEP IRA. Okay, now we're gonna owe 2,000. So it's just a different rhythm um, with, risk and insurance um permanent life insurance and annuities are two categories of products which are often um misrepresented to individuals uh however every financial item on the menu has a purpose it has value, it just needs to be used in the right context. Uh, later on in the business cycle, there are a lot of uses for these things in terms of buy-sell agreements, um, structured buyouts. So for example, if a business owner, uh, let's say two people own a business together, well, one of them passes away. Now, that person's family is the 50% owner of a business. Most likely, that person's family, spouse, sibling, kids, whoever it is, doesn't want to co-own that business. However, the surviving owner doesn't have the money to buy out their 50%. So this creates a very awkward situation and in this, the valuation of the business is often falling because now we have one owner trying to make it work. Employees are wondering what's going on. Like, because insurance is about risk transfer and all forms of insurance calculate risk and provide money where it's needed. Annuities are, anyway, message me later if you want to talk about annuities, but it's basically like, a structured payment over time, but it will pay as long as the owner lives or whoever. Anyway, disability overhead insurance. So now if you have employees, you gotta keep revenue going because it's not just you, but it's them. If you have a disability, not only are you not getting paid, but maybe they're not getting paid. I had a, a, a client on claim who um, she's a dentist, she has nerve damage in her neck. So she had to miss six months An overhead expense policy covers her rent, her payroll and those things and allowed her to hire a replacement for that period of time. Um, without it, it, you know, things would have looked pretty bleak because she would be on the hook for paying people. If she recovered, they'd be like, they left, they got other jobs because they need to make money too. So you see how timing is everything with, with risk management. Okay, so last step here, a couple things for the, for the, the business that is, um, already up and running. So profit first accounting. Uh, at the end of last week, I was asked a question about um, another uh, 
popular like personal finance pathway, the total money makeover. And my short response was, anytime you have a, a kind of mass market message, there's a target audience, it's good for a lot of people. There's always cases where it doesn't work or isn't appropriate. Now, I think Profit First Accounting, it's a book, you can put, put it in the follow-up email. Um, what I found really helpful about the system, since I have no background in accounting, is that it gave me some sort of framework on how much I should pay myself and how much I should spend. So this is a free download. And what we're looking at are levels of revenue the first being less than 250 and saying, hey, target is pay yourself, the owner, 50%. You got to escrow money for taxes, operating expense, profit 5%. To my point earlier with the profit is like, if you're not, if you don't have any money to reap the rewards of being a business owner, then kind of like, what's the point? Like, so what you'll see is over time, the owner pay goes down, whereas the profit goes up. Um, so this is a worksheet. It's something you can really dig into. There's a book. I found it helpful. Some accountants like it, others don't. The point is it's another tool that you can use and refer to. Um, so CPA, Certified Public Accountant, not everyone needs one. It's just the highest level. It, it's just like a certified financial planner. It's like there's additional certifications. So it could be something you could ask about, especially if you're an established business owner. Um, putting your kids on payroll, that's another thing. Google it. Um, the S-Corp versus the pass-through LLC. This is another thing you can ask an accountant. The S Corp gives you a little more control because there's versus a pass through. It's like if you have a really good year, anything like a pass through is that anything after expenses is taxable to you personally. With an S Corp, you can keep some money inside the business without paying your personal income tax on it. So it, it's just another, it kind of like evens things out a little bit. And let, if you are self-employed, you know, like connect people on your board to each other. So the goal is not to be able to relay my message to your accountant and vice versa. Why don't you just like connect us or these people with each other and let them work it out on your behalf? Because you're a business, you're serving your customers, as are other businesses. That's the magic of it. This was up on screen last week. Um, it's a little more detail on different levels, things to consider, things to think about. So we go through this, think back to the best and worst case scenario. Um, I think my intention, I know that my intention has not been to be very prescriptive, um, straight from Rain's website. It's like, our goal is not to like tell you what to do, but to connect you to resources and in partnership with them and Nate, like that's been my intention to not be like, do this, do this, do this five steps to financial magic, but like, hey, these are things to think about. Um, and get started if you haven't yet. Because your perception is your reality. And so what you think you're capable of, uh, the value that you bring to your customers, the story that you tell yourself 
about your narrative with money, that is a real tangible factor. And uh, to that end, where we go from here, and Nate can speak to this a little bit, is if you want, we're doing 15 minute sessions. Um, in the next two weeks, I've set some time aside. I can share that with Nate. And then going forward, this is going to be a recorded resource that Rain has for you. And if you have any questions, um, always reach out. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Back yeah, to you, Nate. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll be putting up a link. Brett, we'll work together to, to create that link and so people can sign up for the 15 minute sessions. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Lots, lots of stuff to think about. And I think this will be really helpful for people. I love how you broke it up in the terms of those phases. So I think that's the reality too, is that, I mean, I just think even that alone is sort of acknowledging that people often go into entrepreneurship in phases. I, I was a part of a, of a startup accelerator one time where, uh, I think maybe the organizer of the accelerator knew that people were maybe uh, self-conscious about how they were kind of making this personally work financially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they asked everybody, they uh, sort of a icebreaker question was like, Hey, what's everybody doing? What are your side hustles? Like, what is everybody doing to pay the bills these days? And people had, you know, different ways that they were also making money beyond their, their startup. And I think that was really powerful because there's sort of this acknowledgement that like, yeah, probably none of us are, making so much money that it's meeting all of our needs just as we're starting. And so let's just get it out there in the open that like, you know, we're, we're all, we're all trying to make it work and someday hopefully we'll right. drop those side hustles or whatever, you know, cause we can do this all full time. But of course, entrepreneurship doesn't just like happen, you know, like a light switch or whatever. So I thought that was great. Um, I'll say that a lot of people have been pretty excited to receive your book in the mail. I'm getting word from folks that that, uh, that that happened and they're excited to give it a read. So yeah. uh, I encourage people to, to check this out. And I appreciate again, your commitment, I guess, to um, to share stories uh, as opposed to just bullet point to-do lists, because I, I do think that there is, I believe that there's a lot of entrepreneurs who, um, for whom it's not necessarily that they lack bullet points in their life of all the things that they need to get done, but they, but they lack a sense of, uh, you know, inspiration from other entrepreneurs that look like them too. Oftentimes the only stories of entrepreneurship we hear are just the, the folks that are the billionaires or whatever. And then it's kind of, you kind of get, get lost and well, I'm not a billionaire yet. So how does that relate to me or what should I do right now? So that's a lot to say. Thanks so much for this. Really appreciate that. We're able to put this workshop together. I think people are going to find this recording, uh, very valuable. And uh, we'll continue to add links and things to some of this content that you are willing to share. So I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, with that, pleasure. yeah, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording uh, and then we can, we can wrap up and yeah, let people return to their day. Thanks so much, Brett.